at Valley GMC in Auburn, serving our community for six seconds. So these are a couple things I wanted everyone to know. The first stuff you need to worry about is how and where are you going to charge? How much is it going to cost? Is it more or less than an ICE engine? ICE engine is an internal combustion engine or a standard gas motor or diesel. Um, and then what overall cost of ownership should you expect? Different types of EVs that are out here, um, most of our time is going to be focused, actually all of our time other than right now is going to be focused talking about, talking about BEVs. These are solely electric battery powered vehicles. Um, the majority of the stuff coming out, out now is, are those, but you also have a plug-in hybrid, which there are some out there, and a plug-in hybrid is battery powered with a small gas engine involved. The old Chevy Volt was a plug-in hybrid. Also, there is a Ford Fusion. There's a couple others out there um, that is an option. The last one is the rarest. Um, there's not very many of them out there. Um, it's a fuel cell electric vehicle. It generates electricity through a chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen uh, in a fuel cell. And there's a, there's a little bit, of, there's very little infrastructure available for this and there's very few cars out there. I know Hyundai and Kia have an option for it. There are, by infrastructure, I mean there are 60 total locations in the state of California that you can even get a fuel cell. Very small, but this is something that certain companies are thinking may also be the answer to non-fossil uh, fuel powered engines. So just thought I'd bring that up. And then the next thing is charging options. There's terminology used a lot in EVs. There's level one, level two, or level three charging. So I'm gonna explain each one of those. Level one is just your standard plug in the wall, okay? 120 volts, generally provides two to five miles range. This old, Anytime I quote a range, the, the range on miles on charging will be caused by how much your car can handle, how much power is coming out of whatever source you're getting it from, and then also um, what, the equipment you, what the equipment used to provide the charge. So now this is good for people who don't have long commutes at all and don't want as much of an upfront cost going in an EV. So if you think about that, you drive really short uh, distances most days, you can probably get away with a 10 hour charge of 50 miles if that's about how much you drive a day. Level two charging. Now this is the one that majority of people who own EVs will end up with set up at their house. Um, it utilizes a 240 volt outlet, which is the same as your washer and dryer, um, you can also get this one hardwired in. Now, if you get it, the, your charger, because you have to buy an actual charger, if you get it hardwired in, you will, you will be, you'll do that to get the higher of these ranges. And the ranges can be anywhere from 15 to 60 miles an hour in kilowatt, or in kilowatt hours. So a couple examples, if you're trying to calculate how much it would cost, uh, you have the these are GM chargers, so I'm going to use that as the example. The lower level charger is $599, and you can see here you only get 9.6 kilowatt hours uh, when it's just plugged in versus 11.5, and that's where you get the difference in 15 and 60 miles. And kilowatt hours, by the way, is kilowatt hours is their version of miles per gallon on electric. And if you want to do a comparison of one kilowatt hour or one, miles per, one mile per gallon versus how many kilowatt hours that takes, it's 0.33 kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt hour goes a little bit farther. And then also we have the Power Up Plus, which is this little higher, uh, more power output. It has a substantial change, but this one has to be wired into your house. And this is where you can start getting close to that 60 mile range per night. Also, once again, a lot goes into a, a count to get to 60. You need the right amount of power coming through there. You need the right amount of uh, ability of your car to, to charge. So each car can charge differently. Install cost is usually around 1000 to 1500 but actually 
from what I've seen, it may be closer to $2,000 to install the actual charger hardwire. So if you, if you decided to hardwire a power up level two, you're probably looking three to $4,000, okay? That includes the charger. And then level three charging, so anytime you hear fast charging or DC fast charging, that's what level three charging is. There are actually different levels to this, um, but in general, it's a, it's a group of them. And they can get a whole bunch of power pumped into your car in a short amount of time. You can get it, can provide anywhere from 60 to 100 miles of range in just 20 to 30 minutes. These are usually seen, um, usually you have to pay to use these. Also, they uh, or should not probably be used. You're not gonna use these on a daily basis is what I would say. And then the, other, the reason for its ability to uh, be so fast charging it is because when the power comes from the electric company, it's in a AC form, the car needs it in DC form. All the other chargers, when you plug it into the car, it goes into the car, the car then converts it from AC to DC to charge the charge it. The DC fast charger converts it itself and, go, and skips that step in your car and goes directly to the battery. So that's why it's so much faster. So this is the big questions you need to ask yourself is how far do you drive daily? Uh, what level charging do you have available to you? And how does it fit your lifestyle? So, so Sebda, how? Less than that, 10 miles. 10 miles? Yeah. All right, so you could probably, for the most part, get away with just without doing the level two charger, doing a level one charger and plugging it in normally because you should be able to re replenish all the energy you use each night. Uh, Rena, how far do you drive daily? 15 to 20 miles. 15 to 20 miles. So, probably about the same. Uh, let's say, since I know Tony doesn't drive that far, um, uh, let's say you were driving 50 miles each way a day. So you're doing 100 miles. That's when you would probably need to get into the level two, or if you just don't want, if you want the flexibility that it gives you, the level two would be able to handle majority of your charging. So in a perfect world, you never have to actually stop to get a charge. So I'm trying to think what's 50 miles. That'd be like if you drove from Auburn to Seattle every day and back, right? right. And then, yeah. yeah. And then on top of that, how many times do you wake up in the morning, have a full tank of gas and have to get gas that same day, right? Two, you don't. More than I like. So <laughs> yeah, unless you're driving Not long much. distances and yeah. that's when the level three DC fast chargers come into effect. So, uh, how does it fit your lifestyle? Okay, because then you got to go into all right. The normal stuff you have to look, talk about when you're buying any car is: does it fit enough people? Does it fit your kids' car seats? Do you tow? Do you go off roading? These are all now with the wider options in EVs available for just a, you know there's a, there's an option available for you for the majority of this stuff. Right as of right now, there is no three row SUV though, but they're coming. So, and then what level charging do you have available to you? So there is better infrastructure and worse infrastructure depending on where you live. So you gotta make sure you know that. Um, if you're in Eastern Washington, uh, it's a little bit harder, but there is infrastructure available to you in most, in most towns there is a, at least one, um, DC fast charger available to you. But once again, you're more than likely going to be able to the majority of the days live off of your charging system setup you have at your house. And then on top of that, if you do go on a trip, uh, there are multiple tools available to you. And I'm going to use the stuff that I know of from GMC. I know that all the other brands have similar setups. Um, right here, this is a map from Google and all of the GMCs have a, a Google system for their maps. You put in the location you're trying to get to, and it will do a couple different things for you. First off, it will point out any chargers and the different levels. Like I said, DC fast charging has two levels to it. And it'll tell you how fast it will take you to charge. But more importantly, it will say down here that when you get to your location, how much your charging, your charge will be at. 
So in this scenario, when they get there, it'll be at 48. When you go to actually select, when you put in where your location into the map, it will pop up. And before you accept it, it will actually, at that point, tell you on your return trip, how far you'll be, what, what percentage you'll be when you, when you come home. So also the MyGMC app, uh, the MyGMC app gives you the access to be able to check in on the ch charge of your car when you're not at your car or if you're plugged in at a station. It will also tell you where different charging stations are. And through the MyGMC app, you can sign up to be members of certain charging networks, which will give you discounts on charging. So along the route, you can see the charging stations and they're rated. What does that mean? Well, just the speed, speed with which. So uh, it doesn't go as cleanly as level one, two, and three, because obviously there's four options here, but some of them. So there's newer and older um, level three chargers. So the newer ones have a little bit better capacity and they are now rated a four. They're still level three chargers. Okay. So that's what it's that's what it's yeah. So what's the lowest level three charger? Do you know? Is like a two, if, is a two going to be, that's, that's gonna fast? That's going to be level two. Okay. That's a level one. Okay. okay. And then the Tesla network is available to GM vehicles. Uh, they're having some issues getting us enough charger adapters at the moment, but that will clean up really quickly. And then you'll be able to access that as well, because GM and Tesla made it. So let's explain how much does it cost to actually charge your vehicle all the way. So if you go, if you do it in a public station, uh, the fees range from uh, 10 cents to 40 cents per kilowatt hour. I'm going to guess in this part of the country, we're closer to the 40 than we are the 10. Also, some of them do it by time, and that's 10 to 50 cents. Once again, I'm gonna guess we're on the higher side of that. And there's some other fees you may need to pay, which is like a membership fee for a network or idle fee. So if you plug in, go into the, like at the malls, they all have chargers. If you plug in to charge your electric vehicle, walk into the mall, and you're, it's, a, it's a, pay, a station that you need to pay for. So you walk into the mall and you're charged all the way to 80% or whatever you have it set to charge to and it stops charging, but your car is still parked there, plugged in for another two hours. Some stations will charge you for being idle at their station because then nobody else can access the charger and they cannot sell it anymore. So that's another fee you may have to worry about. At home charging, which this is, once again, if you're buying an electric car, at home should be the priority of how you actually charge. Okay. The electricity rates in the United States uh, range from 13 cents per kilowatt hour to 20 cents. And on this one, we're actually the lowest. So we are 13 cents. In Washington, it's because we got all that damn power. Damn. Uh, so if you wanted to calculate the total cost of charging your vehicle from zero to 100%, you figure out what the battery capacity on your vehicle is per kilowatt hour. You take that number, you times it by the cost per kilowatt hour. So in this example here, a 200 kilowatt hour uh, battery at 15 cents, using a middle ground here, is $30 to charge. By comparison, the Hummer and the CRV, 205 kilowatt hours at 13 cents, you'd probably be right around that $30 to charge it full. Is that more or less than it costs you to fill up a large SUV with gas? Less. Thank you, Tom. Maintenance. Um, there are lower maintenance needs on, a, on an electric vehicle because of fewer moving parts. Um, there's a lot of standard maintenance products and things that you're used to doing that you will never not have to do anymore with an electric vehicle. Um, first off, oil changes. You do not need oil changes. There is no oil. No fuel pumps, fuel filters, or ejectors. There's no exhaust system, so no catalytic converters or mufflers. No transmission maintenance, no spark plugs, and no air filters. And that's engine air filters. There are still cabin air filters in a lot of them. So. Uh, brakes, you're less likely to use up your brakes because of regenerative braking, you should expect longer interval, intervals. So, regenerative braking, it uses the heat and uh, from slowing the vehicle down to help charge the battery, to 
to increase the range available to you. Uh, most vehicles have the ability to turn it on and off. It takes up to a little time to get used to it, one pedal driving. A uh, higher maintenance needs, you gotta do tire rotations and tire replacements more often. These cars are a lot heavier. So that will go up. So if you decide to buy uh, an EV, the number one worry everyone has is how long is that battery gonna last and what, and am I gonna have issues with it? So here are a couple uh, ways to help keep your battery healthy. Uh, there are some maintenance you can do on the battery, but that depends on which vehicle you're talking about. So these are some things you can do in general. Avoid whenever possible um, extreme temperatures. We don't have that big of an issue up here in the Northwest, but in other parts of the country, that is a big deal. So if you have a garage, shaded area, park there. This is a battery, just like a, the battery in your phone. Uh, extreme cold or heat can affect it. Also, uh, precondition the vehicle. And by that, I mean, if your car, if it's really cold and uh, you know that you're gonna wanna bla blast the heat or it's really hot out, you're gonna wanna blast the AC as soon as you get in that car. You might as well remote start it, get that thing getting heat, heat, heated or cooled before you even get in it while it's still plugged in. You don't have to worry about uh, smogging up your garage because there is no exhaust, right? So there's a reason why you don't start your car while it's sitting in the garage because then you walk in the garage and you may not make it out. You don't have to worry about that on an electric vehicle. So that is great to help the health of the vehicle because then the, the hardest part of heating or cooling the car is going from really hot to cool or really cold to hot. Once it's there, it's easier to maintain. So the other thing is you really should on a day-to-day -day basis live within the 20 to 80% charging. If you charge it all the way to 100, it puts extra stress on the battery. Um, and use level two charging or level one charging as much as possible. You really should avoid everyday use of DC fast charging because it is harder on the battery. Uh, make sure you know what, it, what warranty is on the battery. Each manufacturer has different ones and also what it covers. So some warranties cover loss of capacity. The GM one does. Everyone had a cell phone for five years, and when you first got it, it could last all day charged, and five years later, it only lasts half the day, and then you have to charge it. That's why I'm talking about lack of capacity, right? So the GMC battery warranty is eight years, 100,000 miles, and if in seven years and 99,000 miles, your uh, charge is only able to get you to what used to be 60% charge, of your battery, they will replace the battery. So, or fix whatever it is to get it back to where it was beforehand. Also, okay, so now, say you decide you wanna go forward with, you understand all the, the entry costs, and now you wanna go forward and get an EV. Well, the next question you have to ask yourself is, am I gonna buy or lease it? Almost half the people buying EVs are, le are leasing. It's, it's at 48% of all EVs sold are leased. First is only 25% of ICE engines are leased. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is under the, the, under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there's a $7,500 EV credit. Okay. That does not, there's a bunch of different rules and regulations to getting that EV credit on a purchase. Price of the vehicle you're buying, how much money you make, all that. But if you lease it, it falls under a commercial vehicle with the Inflation Reduction Act. So you are eligible for it without having to hit all those markers. It's a loophole, but the manufacturer has taken advantage of it, right? So it's actually the manufacturer who will, uh, will apply for that. And uh, what they'll do in GM's case is they're increasing your residual by 7,500 bucks to lower your payment. Each manufacturer is handling a little bit different. So another reason to lease is you don't have as much worry about the unknown and the future of the EV market because you have a safety net per se. Two years, three years, four years, however long you lease the car, at the end of it, you're able to walk away if say 
the values, formats, and that can happen for many different ways and reasons. Excuse me, I didn't interrupt. Some of those things are more government intervention. Uh, we're seeing that a lot with some of the lower priced used EVs right now where uh, uh, there are some changes in pricing. Also, uh, what happens if they figure out how to make a really cheap battery in two years and all of a sudden the cost of EVs go down by 30%? Brand new, do you think your used one will be worth anywhere near as much as you paid for it in three years? So it protects you against all that. The reason to purchase is you do have more flexibility. It's easier to get out of a purchase early. And if you plan on keeping it, it also is a if you plan on keeping it for five years, it is a better, majority of the time, it's better for you financially. All right, let's talk about the ones that we have here. We have the Hummer EV. Uh, the Hummer EV comes in two different models. You have the uh, SUV and the SUT. The SUT is the truck version versus the SUV model. Um, <coughs> I'm gonna talk about the range here. I'll show, we have them outside, so I can show it to you afterwards. Um, but the range is 30, uh, 311 to 381 miles. Uh, there's two options. There's a 20 mod battery and a 24. The 24 is only available on the truck because the truck is uh, a larger wheelbase, more space. When I say mod, it's essentially like think about it like, okay, how big is your fuel tank, right? So obviously the 24 is a bigger fuel tank. It has 212 kilowatt hour capacity. Versus the 20 mod is 205. The majority of them we have are 205 mile capacity. And so they run in that 211 to 28, or 311 and 318 mile range. Okay. Lastly, we have the Sierra V, which just came out. So GM estimates it can get up to 440 miles range. That's wild. That's a big number. Um, they are only out with the addition ones, and uh, they also have a 205 kilowatt battery capacity. The reason why a 205 is farther on the Sierra V than the Hummer, it weighs a lot less. It also has better aerodynamics. What's 440 miles away from here? I'm trying to think, it's 500 miles away from here. Montana. Whoa, well, that's further than I expected. Yeah, like middle of Montana. Um, so, well, Pullman is 200. There and back is two. You only have the skinny part of Idaho. Just there. Two so. Yeah, and then you only have the skinny part of Idaho. So, so you get, two. Okay, yeah. okay. So you got double that, yeah. yeah. But okay. but Auburn to Pullman, you could get there and back on one charge almost, almost. right? Yeah. Almost. That's, that's wild. All right, any questions? Well, let's talk about something that I don't think anyone mentioned. I didn't bring it up earlier, towing. Um, I know on the Sierra EV, it's rated around it's right around 9,000 pounds, which is exactly the same as our ICE motors. And also, from what I've been told, now it, it's such a new vehicle, I haven't seen it tested out, that it should only lose 20% of its charge when underweight, when, when towing, which is equivalent to about how much gas mileage uh, you lose with towing as well. We do have a customer who's bought a Hummer and has towed his trailer to Eastern Washington with his Hummer and uh, he said it's been a great experience so that's cool I thought I have a question yeah no, what do I've, you need to make it a generator for your house um, if you hardwire a, a larger level two charger into your house you can if your power goes out you can run your house for up to 28 days just off of your truck wow. what 